what's out there, you know? And uh, so really, and it, you know, if they say that it's over, it's like almost even foolish to say it's just different now, right? It's just like, it's just changed. You know? And the thing I want to say a little bit about with the topic for this evening and tomorrow is that um, one thing that happens, I think, for us, that's really something we all have to kind of keep an eye on and really kind of get some courage is that a lot of times when life gets hard, we don't rise to the occasion. We kind of fall deeper into complacency and we kind of fall deeper into like our low grade, destructive behaviors. A little bit more phone, a little bit more social media, a little bit more sugar, a little bit more caffeine, a little bit more carbs. You know what I mean? The, the slumber of the world is kind of like, we just kind of don't want to deal. Right, so we, we take comfort in things that actually aren't very comfortable. Right, and that's, again, that's one of these things that's almost, um, it's what the Buddha calls the honey-tipped arrow. I mean, I love that thought of a honey-tipped arrow. For us, it's like, mmm, this is, wow. And we, we kind of give into our habits a little bit. And it's, um, and that goes, can go on for a long time and we can kind of get full of procrastination. Are full of fear, or full of why bother, or full of doubt. Um, kind of settle, or we uh, we play it safe, but although we're not really playing it that safe, we kind of fall into this comfort zone experience. But if we're honest, the comfort zone is not particularly comfortable, and it's not a lot of room for anybody else. And it's kind of this isolated kind of. When this is over, I'll go back to trying to get it together. And one of the things that I think really infiltrates that, uh, that's a word that the Buddha speaks about, that it's only the context of this word doubt. We all know what doubt is. But the Buddha really singles out doubt as being really kind of the most destructive force in the mind. And nobody else does that. When we think of Western psychology and we think of like mental health even, when we think of like challenging processes of mind of our psychology, usually doubt doesn't really, isn't something that enters the equation. You just say anxiety and depression and overwhelm and trauma, which are all, you know, not pleasant in and of themselves. But I always thought that was interesting. Like, why did you say doubt? Why is doubt so bad? Because doubt robbed us uh, of our opportunity to try. And in particular, skeptical doubt. Uh, and there's two kinds of doubt. There's a kind of, it doesn't work. So I'm not going to bother, or it does work, but I can't do it, or both, which is my favorite kind of doubt. It doesn't work, and I couldn't do it even if it did. And there's this interesting, um, I've been listening to this uh, really interesting podcast from these guys. Anybody watch this social dilemma documentary about social media? Good documentary. The guys who made it, this guy Tristan Harris, this other guy who I worked for for a while at the Mindful Schools organization, have a, a, an organization called the Center for Healthy Technology. And these guys are the ones who made the documentary. And they, they have this, they also have a podcast called Your Undivided Attention, which is on iTunes podcast. It's really good. Really good. And it's all really, it's interesting because basically what we're finding out or what I'm really noticing is that these social media apps and algorithms are using Buddhist psychology against you. Mm-hmm. They're just hijacking your limbic system. And they call it the race to the bottom of the brain, the brain stem. They're like, how can we get all the way down to the lizard brain? All right? It's really kind of fascinating and also really kind of sadistic, I think. Right? But they talk about the, the way that the, 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 the social media culture, just the, the phone as a consumer, and also the, it's the same way that like Gabor Mate speaks about addiction. And that is anything that provides short-term relief but provides long-term harm or consequence. You know, this kind of thing. Feels good now, hurts later. But feels good now. It's like buying a flat screen TV on a like 29% APR credit card. You know what I mean? You've never done this. I mean, you can walk out of Best Buy with that TV and go home and watch it. But you're going to pay $2,000 for that $800 TV over the course of the next three years. But we don't care at the moment, right? We don't want to watch a TV. The smart TV, too, has got the apps inside of it. It's like my phone. I just took a phone on the wall now. How lazy do we have to get? And you can even talk to the remote. You don't even have to, like, deal with pushing the button. You just push the one button and tell them what you want. Like, how lazy 
are we going to actually get? I won't use that feature, actually, because I'm like a little bit too proud. I'm like, I can push the button. <laughs> yeah. And so we do, we find that this is like, I think a really, uh, this is a very real thing. Gabor Mate talks about this, and I think this is really the definition of addiction, is that it's, it's addiction really what it's trying to do is it's uh, any behavior, the psychological behavior or physical behavior, that's trying to avoid change or control the seemingly unbearable conditions of the present moment. Uh, that's really where it gets its kind of grubby little paws on our brain. And the problem with that is it produces, it provides us with short-term relief, but manifests as long-term harm and consequence. And that's a really, I think for the, for the human mind, especially the underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, which most of us have, unfortunately, especially the amygdala system and certainly the limbic system, that's a hard moment to negotiate because what we're being challenged with actually is delaying the gratification and saying, you know what, I'm actually going to be uncomfortable now. I'm just going to be uncomfortable now because I know that being uncomfortable now for me will be better in the long run. I don't think I've ever honestly had that thought arise spontaneously. <laughs> Even though I teach this stuff and I believe that it's true. So we're up against some big stuff here, I think. Some big stuff here. And so I also want to zoom back a little bit in a little bit of, of a public service <coughs> announcement that I think is important as a Dharma teacher, as somebody who is very sort of obsessed with uh, what I would call early Buddhism. And I think that that's really, this is a, a Dharma center. I know that we had an insight group last night and also mindfulness, a lot, a lot of you know mindfulness practice. But really, I think there's a lot of value for me there has been, and I think for us who are Western educated people who know about history and a lot of these things that we like, of really getting a sense for who the, who the historical Buddha was, this man, Siddhartha Gautama. I've been obsessed with trying to uncover him because I, I really like him much more as a person. Um, because I have this doubt, uh, I have a hard time buying into things that sound undoable. Nightmen, some of the stuff that I heard over the years in my Buddhist circles and practices felt like, that sounds too hard. Or maybe it's not too hard, but maybe I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not willing to actually try that hard. And so we can think of him in a couple contexts. We can think of him as a historical religious figure, which is mostly what we know him as, the Buddha. Interestingly enough, in the Pali Canon, which is the recorded earliest teachings, which is 5,000 some odd pages, he's never referred to the Buddha at one time. He's not the Buddha till a thousand years after he dies. 500 years anyway. It's interesting, isn't it? So we can see him at this religious historical figure, which doesn't interest me that much. But we also can see him as actually really what he was in the context of his time and place, if that was a social activist. And we think of this guy wandering around India, ancient India, sitting under trees, all enlightened. No way. He was, this is a man who was very, very involved with his society very, very involved with his culture. Um, and the time uh, that he lived in, 5th century BC India, was a time of great change. Not much different than the great change of the times of today. Very, very different in many, many ways, but very similar. Old ideas were being questioned. There was lots of polarity in the culture. There was lots of old systemic ways of operating that were being um, you know, systemic things like racism, you know, they have racism in Indian Indy too, <laughs> you know, a social class structure, people at the top, the people at the bottom, the great divide between the people at the top and the people at the bottom. He was very, very much pushed back against it. He was not a very well-liked person by many, right? Uh, he, was, he was a total pain in the ass to the people at the top. And the fact that nobody killed him is actually completely and totally profound and fascinating. Because as we know, if we look at history, most people who are advocates and put a lot of energy into real social change, they usually get killed. So this was a person who was also very skilled in human relations, very skilled in politics, very skilled in language, very, very um, skillful, 
person. And also we could see him as a social activist, but also we could see him as, I think probably in the most common way, as a kind of a mental health professional, really as a therapist, as somebody who really understood the human condition. He really understood what we were really up against. And then also that he was also as interested in what we were up against as interested in what our potential was. Now, I think this is the big split. I think that our society, the thing that's sort of a bummer about mental health and psychology and our culture is that we're very much interested and mostly have only studied the bad side of the mind. Why do people do so terrible? We have all these theories, we have all these manuals, we have all this interest in um, why do people struggle so much in all the ways that they do? And so we can kind of have this derogatory attitude towards the mind in general. And people started, people in the 60s and the 70s noticed this, the people, the early people who brought meditation to our culture, uh, people like Jack, Jack Cornfield, Joseph Goldstein, uh, Dharma people, Sharon Salzberg, but then the scientists that were over there sitting in these Galinka retreats, Daniel Goldman, the emotional intelligence writer, Richard Davidson, who's a neuroscientist, an advocate for mindfulness, a bunch of these dudes went to science. And they were like, they're like, they're like, yeah, the, the Buddhist tradition is like this entire tradition that's really interested in the upside of the human mind. What is the potential that we have? We have, we, we have the potential for love and the potential for kindness and the potential for compassion, just as much as we do for divisiveness and hatred and contempt. Okay? So the thing about it that's so interesting is that like from a Buddhist perspective, especially from my early Buddhist perspective, the mind is kind of an ethically neutral system. People are not inherently good, they're not inherently bad, they're inherently coming with all kinds of potentials. Right? And unfortunately, the thing that's really kind of a drag is that, uh, is that the society and the culture and the world that we live in kind of does a number on us when we're younger, and sometimes can, can bring out or coax out or condition the not better parts of our humanity. But it doesn't mean the other ones are gone, are not there. They're just underdeveloped. So we have the capacity for kindness and for generosity and for understanding. They're all in there. And so the thing about Dharma practice that I think is, is the ultimate thing that makes me not feel doubt is actually once you start exercising and, and accessing these potentials, they're not that hard to develop not that hard to develop. But I think we have to, um, first of all, nobody presents it this kind of way. I think we think that mental health or overcoming trauma or addiction or all the things that we struggle with is like Sisyphus in the boulder up the mountain. But it's really not so much, actually. And there's the, the thing I, I think that's so important, and I talked about this a little bit last time, I'll speak about it again because it's in the description, is there's this word in early Buddhism called virya, which is uh, which probably would be best translated as courage. Now, I say this jokingly, but whatever happened to courage? Well, I swear to God, we think like courage is this old thing that like the Greeks and the Romans had, or like we think of courage as like this ancient quality. And it's kind of like almost like a, a concept nobody's interested in anymore. And everything, and, and if you look at the Buddhist list, of course, there's so many of them, but there's this quality that, that shows up all the time, this word virya, which means lots of different things. It really actually, I think, means courage, but sometimes it means um, effort. Sometimes it means endeavor. It's actually triggered by this other emotion that's only an emotion that you only see in Buddhist context, and in particular early Buddhist psychology, samvega, which means spiritual courage, which is which which, which actually, to me, in, in a the way that we would probably think about it in emotional intelligence, it would be on the somewhere in the territory around constructive anger. You ever had that constructive anger where you get so mad, you're like, I'm, God damn it, I'm doing it. I'm tired of this. Anybody who's ever gotten sober, anybody who's overcome any challenge in your life, any difficulty, you kind of, what kind of kicked you in the ass was a little constructive anger. It's like, come on, man, you can do this. Enough is enough. So that, that, that's a quality, I think, that we've kind of lost sight of, the, qu 
quality that we don't necessarily um, think that we have or think that's important or think that we can't. And, uh, I always say, watch out for this quality of mind that so many people I work with have. Uh, I can't because, you know, in your mind, the voice, someone asks you to do something and you really want to do something, you think, well, I can't do that because, and then you have this whole drop down menu of reasons why you can't. So a lot of times those, these I can't because, and these, these doubts and this lack of courage and this, uh, we, we kind of, we kind of can give up on ourselves and just settle. And then we live in a culture that is here to medicate that for you. We'll eat this and watch this and download that. And you don't have to feel bad about yourself. There's, there's so many, there's a whole buffet from destructive all the way down to not super destructive behaviors. And we kind of fall into what my teacher Stephen Smith called the spiritual slumber. We kind of take the nap. It's like, I'll get my shit together next year. Right? You don't. And I struggle with this every day. That's why I bring this up. Like, this is what like, feels very alive. You know, whether it's eating better or losing weight or, or getting into therapy or uh, all these things that we know that we need to do, that we want to do, that we feel moved to do. But we can't because so many of these reasons we talk ourselves out of it. And I think that if we don't see this as part of a Dharma practice, not only this part of Dharma practice, but this seems to be down in the DNA. This seems to be really, really down in kind of one of the first things that the Buddha recognized and he talked about, like we have to have some kind of fire that gets ignited, some kind of spark, some kind of motivation. Yeah. And it's usually you know, it's not usually born out of enjoyable experiences. Like usually the things that motivate us, the things that spark, that ignite us, that, that get us to maybe look under rocks we haven't looked under before or, or try things differently going in a different direction, usually comes out of deep pain. It's, it's sad to admit that pain is a great motivator for many of us. That just seems the way it is because we start to see that um, there's a, I forget his name, I always forget his name because I quote it all the time. There's an addiction specialist doctor in San Diego who has this really poignant phrase. He says, you can never get enough of something that almost works. Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed that scrolling kind of almost works? Almost, just a little more. Right? And there's so many things I find in my life that almost actually work. And they do, they're just kind of, but they just mute the emotional undertone. They just kind of pause, they kind of procrastinate. And then you kind of get depressed a little bit. So, so, so it's so easy and so hard at the same time, which is why I find it to be very irritating. Like, I find for me in my life, I can easily get up early in the morning and sit and practice meditation for 30 minutes or 45 minutes, which I do most days. I can easily do that, it's not a problem. It's so easy to not do it. What's the hinge? What's the, what's the tipping point? Whether we do it or don't do it, right? And I think this is something that we actually have to put some time into. We have to, we have to uncover we have to discover, we have to clear away the debris of the spiritual slumber and really maybe ask ourselves some difficult questions or really try to get into that kind of, sometimes it's called zeal, vitality, vigor, valor, courage, that kind of little bit of can do. Once uncovered, once we can kind of get access to that, it really is the, the proverbial snowball that rolls down the hill once we start to see the benefits of that. But that takes a little bit of time. And then again, we're back to that moment of like, I could do something uncomfortable right now that I know would have far-reaching consequences for the benefit of myself and others. Or I could just do this other thing, which is like really pleasant right now, really. And I think that that's a, that's a really, that's, to me, that seems to be the hardest moment. And I think we also have to get out of the black and white thinking and that you're not, this is not a switch that you turn on, that you actually have, you'll find yourself having to negotiate that moment hundreds and hundreds and if not thousands of times. 
And I think actually, you know, not that I would go with the math on this one, but 5149 will win in the long run. Mm -hmm. It will. 6040 would be nicer. Mm -hmm. But 991 is probably not going to be how it goes. And so a lot of times we have to um, get our, I know that for me I have to, and I'm not good at this, I have to try to get my motivation or my expectations down in the arena of reality and what's actually realistic possible because if i if i screw up one day i'm like see i'm like why bother you didn't even do it today you know you, you just stop trying you're just not going to do it that kind of feeling of being a failure there's this wonderful book by one of my friends and, and teachers that i really like named stephen bachelor some of you might know stephen bachelor he's done a lot of work around secular buddhism and really actually trying to do a lot of what i'm talking about trying to uncover the historical person here and he had wrote this book called confessions of a buddhist atheist the first book by him I read, I only bought it because the book title was so cool. I think I bought it at Barnes and Noble. Remember Barnes and Noble? Do they still have Barnes? <laughs> or the Amazon and Nobles then? Remember bookstores? I miss bookstores. You guys have a couple around here, don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah, right. I remember buying it. I was, like, I was like, I have no idea who this guy is or what this is about, but that's a cool title. And there's a chapter in there called The Buddhist Failure. It's one of my favorite chapters in a book that I was like so happy to hear. Yeah, I feel that that too. And I think that the thing is we have to kind of um, realize that it's it's not an all or nothing game. And so even the Buddha talks about this analogy he uses that I like. He says, a tree that that leans to the west will fall to the west. And if, a tree that, if it's leaning that way, it's going that way. If a tree that leans to the east will fall to the east. So I think as far as when we're talking about mind cultivation, which I think is really where it begins, is we just have to get ourselves leaning you know, in the um, right direction. It takes a lot of effort. It takes patience. It takes perseverance, which are also qualities of this word very. We have to be patient, but we have to be persistent. We have to persevere. My son Emmett in the other room is obsessed with the space travel, NASA. We've been watching all these shows on that. And it turns out, I did not know this, that the uh, when they put the space shuttle, uh, NASA, they put the space shuttle wherever it goes, it's off course 98% of the time. Mm -hmm. But it still makes it. <laughs> so think of the amount of, they have to make like every millisecond, they have to make an adjustment. Right? And I think that's how it goes. Mm -hmm. And so I find that it's trying to get my mind organized towards a kind of perspective, A, that's realistic and doable, and then B, that kind of you know, I just gotta just kind of just get it leaning in the right direction. And so, and that all starts in the mind, why meditation is so important. Because um, even the Buddha says, you know, whatever we pay attention to, or whatever we, fre we frequently ponder upon, wherever we put our mind will become the natural inclination of the mind. So, so we, we, we've been training our minds since the moment we got here. In, in all these kind of different ways. Some of the ways better than others, some not so good, some okay. But it turns out you can teach an old dog new tricks. And so we, we can really get into this idea that our minds are kind of like, we're kind of stuck with these terribly habituated things. And some of this, like my mind is just like this horrible contraption. It just doesn't run very well. And I can get complacent, I can get doubtful, and I'm like, oh, this what it really wants to do. I can't take it anymore. But it really is an open system. It's really not like that, which is, I think, one of the most encouraging things about the emergence of Dharma practice, the cultivation of the mind, neuroscience, these kinds of ideas, which are very attractive to people like us, are very attractive in the modern parlance, because, you know, if science says it's so, we're a little more likely to give it a shot, right? Let's be real. But it really is an open system. The mind is neuroplastic. It's, it can, it can unlearn old things. It can develop new things. And so this, again, this mind cultivation, whatever we pay attention to and frequently ponder on, will become a natural inclination the mind will incline towards that quality. So we might think, oh, 20 minutes a day, or, you know, that happens to me. I'm like, what am I really going to get out of this? 30 minutes of watching my breath. I don't, I don't see how that's going to compute in the grand scheme of things of really having that much impact. Right? And I still get these thoughts 
way too often, and I am totally convinced that this shit works. <laughs> you know what I mean? I really am. I, and, and, but I, again, like I was talking about this last time, I think the big problem is that the opposite of mindfulness is forgetfulness. And so I think that one of the things that's so hard to do is, we, is to try to remember what is it that's really valuable to us. Like, what is it that's really important to you at the end of the day? It's probably not what's stressing you out all day. Like, if you look at your quote unquote bad days, or you look at those days where you really feel overwhelmed, or you feel stressed, or you feel struggle, if you really had your wits about it and sat down and looked at it, you realize most of the stuff we get all worked up about is like, I don't actually really care that much anyway. So it's really actually, I think, an ongoing practice. One of the things that we're trying to remember, or to mindfulness and remember to recollect, which I think is a good word, is um, a sense of purpose. Why do we get out of bed in the morning? What's really important to us? And, and I find it fascinating how easy it is for me to forget what's important to me. Especially like when I can't get into some account because I forgot my password. And I'm ready to like blow up the, the fucking internet. <laughs> I'm like, if I had a red button, I would blow this whole thing to smithereens right now. You know what I mean? I'm like, God, I didn't take it. It took me like two seconds to get worked up like that. We get so worked up about things that aren't that important. And so when we think about uh, coming into our practice, we um, have to realize that mindfulness, and particularly in its association with early Buddhist practice, is much more of about, about our ethics and our sense of values and our sense of purpose. And why do you get out of bed in the morning? You know, it, you know we, have our, we have our concerns and worries. We have our personal concerns and worries. We have our the families and our family lives, the people that are important to us, friends. These kinds of things, our relationships, actually. So again, also, we because of our culture and the way that we think about things, that we oftentimes think of mindfulness. Or here we are, we all have our own cushion, right? Like even that's a little bit awkward, right? Like we everybody has their own little spot, and we can think that we're practicing just for the benefit of ourselves. We just, if I practice, I just want to have, uh, in the privacy of my own mind, I just want to have a more peaceful, more to relax, more easeful experience. So the, indivi the over-individualization, not that self-help is a problem, but this is not a self-help thing, really. This is about other people. This is about the people that you care about. Sometimes the people that you care about are the people who irritate you the most. Have you noticed? So there's actually a relational quality to practice. I think that gets overlooked and undervalued and underemphasized would be the word I would think about it. And so there's the word metta, metta sometimes called loving kindness, but really more, more about friendliness or affection. Or something that is dear to us. This is, this is the, the, I think, the quality of mind that precedes everything. So even in early exclamations, or the early uh, way that the Buddha talks about mindfulness and metta, he doesn't talk about them as being different things. Or right mindfulness is metta, metta is right mindfulness. So it's a, it's a friendliness, uh, kindness. And so the way we think about that is like, for me, I always get into these wonderful, what is that actually like? What are the mechanics there? Like, that sounds good. How do you do that? I used to use this analogy a lot when I lived in, um, I call it airport meta. And I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I, when I lived in Los Angeles, I was flying, I was traveling a lot. And by the time, if you, you can watch this if you go to the airport, you probably do it here too. By the time the person makes it to the curb, they've gotten off the plane, it's a haggard looking group of folks. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're finally at the curb waiting for your ride. You got your bag. You've been through whatever you just went through. <laughs> wherever you were, whatever happened, how you got there, and it's just like a very haggard look. It's like a whole row of people who just look like they're just about to lose it. But the car pulls out, and their kids get out, and their wife gets out, somebody, and their whole experience changes. Right? They're, it's almost like somebody like lights them on fire. The smile comes up. It's like all this enthusiasm and all this kindness and all this friendliness, all this love, really. 
And they just go from that to that, right? So quick, it's so fun to watch. In the same way that when, we, uh, when we're with friends, it's easier to think about this stuff with others because a lot of us, let's be honest, don't really feel like we're really our own best friends. As, you know, as my teacher asked me years ago, as I was about to leave a meditation retreat because I was getting tired of the loving kindness sessions. And I said, I think I'm gonna go. <laughs> I was like, I just don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's, you know. I remember sitting there and saying those phrases, man, be at ease, man, be happy. And then a voice in my mind would go, really? Has it really come down to this, Dave? Is this really where we're at? <laughs> like, has it really gotten so bad? That you're going to sit in this room for 10 days and say nice things to yourself. <laughs> and I got up to leave and they said, he asked me, is your mind a friendly companion? How did that have to do with anything? <laughs> my mind a friendly companion. <laughs> no, my mind is an asshole. That's why I'm leaving. <laughs> we don't get that. But when we're with other people, it's a lot easier because we know what it's like to sit down with a friend for tea or for coffee or breakfast, so we haven't seen anybody, and when you're with somebody you haven't seen in a while, and you sit down, two qualities happen. A, there is attention, which is not really a pretty basic thing. Attention is not esoteric. We all know what that is. It's a good word. We, we know what it means to pay attention. There's attention, but there's also interest. Right? And if you're on the receiving end of somebody's attention and their interest in what you have to say, doesn't that feel so good? Isn't that what we really, really what we need? Some people actually would call it, that's actually the definition of love. When somebody's paying attention to you and they're generally interested in what you have to say. And then there's the reciprocity. That's where friendliness is, right? It's just like, and then when you think about that, what happens is we get into this timeless dharma, where you, you ever notice that time, when you're with a friend hanging out and talking, time is gone. And we look at the, the research on, on mind rumination or the kind of the dark side of mind wandering. Mind wandering isn't all bad. Mind wandering gets a bad rap in a room like this. I realize that. Thinking gets a bad rap in a room like this. It's not all bad. But rumination or discursive thinking sometimes it's called is, is this kind of thinking that's very kind of didactic and very kind of task worry oriented. And when we're ruminating, we're thinking of four categories. We're thinking of the past and the future, big surprise there, self and other. Those are the four main categories of mind wandering. And, they, and generally speaking, when we're done with that little episode of mind wandering, we kind of just feel that. You know, we, just, we, we have assessed that this person in my life is actually a bad person. Come to, I've, I've come to many conclusions here, and I've decided that they're just bad. Mm -hmm. Now I feel bad. Mm -hmm. But, but self, self and other past and future gone when we're in the front end space. And it feels good not to be dictated by those. Now, if you're having conflict with somebody or disagreeing with somebody, or if you don't like them and you're in somebody's presence, do you notice there's a sense, the feeling of self and others very strong? I'm me, you're you, I'm right, you're wrong. I don't know where we're going to go from here. We get locked right in, right? But kind of the opposite of that. But we can kind of get that way internally. It's easier to talk about it with other people, but when we, but you ever feel that way internally? There's like the kind of thinking that's you arguing. Have you argued with yourself in your own mind? Why did you do that? Because you told me to do that. Mm -hmm. I didn't think you were not actually doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to really do this again. <laughs> but, and so there's a, there's a lot of ways that we want to try to really kind of get our mindfulness practice and our metta. Really kind of, I, I think I'll, you, I like what I work with people in my mentoring program. My goal is to get people to the point where whether they're sitting for 30 minutes doing mindfulness and method, they actually don't, can't tell the difference between the two. It is, they're the same. We're in our bodies, we're in our breathing. Doesn't mean that we like ourselves or that we're happy about everything that we do or that we've agreed with every choice we've made. It's not that. We try to extend ourselves the same expectations and the same forgiveness and the same understanding we would a good friend. Like we, I mean, if you held other people to the standards that you hold yourself to, you would not have a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. For some of us, that's true, not for everybody. Some people could actually benefit a little bit by holding themselves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
that's the thing that makes me sad about the work that I do. It's like, I know all these amazing people come on retreats and come on Dharma retreats and are in different programs I'm with. And it's like, the people, the best people think they're like that. And the worst people think they're fabulous. And like, <laughs> somehow the wires got crossed. I'm like, you have no idea how amazing you are. And then other people are just like, think that they're fabulous. <laughs> you could like me kind of, uh, speak a little bit more about what we call you, you mentioned it a little bit earlier uh, this word sila or ethics it's not a great term to uh in the buddhist context so there's really three trainings right we train in meditation which is sort of obvious maybe uh we train in ethics or sila integrity integrity might be a better word than ethics actually and then we train in wisdom and so I want to talk, I'll speak a little bit too about what this training in ethics or what this training in integrity looks like and, and ways to think about it so we don't just think, because here's the thing, we all grew up in America, most of us I would imagine, and we all grew up with this kind of religious idea of thou shalt not, right? And then all of a sudden we hear about precepts and we hear about right speech and right action. And for me, and a lot of times I go, here comes the teacher who's going to roll out the thou shalt not card, right? And I don't think, I think that's in the water that we swim in, whether you grew up religious or whether you believe in religion or whatever your relationship to religion is, you would be naive to think that, that it's not built into your operating system, right? It just is part of the culture. And so uh, there's three actually practices that we speak about that I want to kind of tease apart a little bit to make them more dynamic, because I think they're very exciting practices, but they've mostly been reserved in the Buddhist tradition, which has largely been a monastic tradition, let's be honest, 2,500 years, Buddhist practice, I would say in the high 90 percentile, people who have practiced Buddhism for the last two and a half thousand years are people who are monastics or lived in a monastic setting, which I applaud and respect and value. I, I think that we'd be in big trouble without those folks, but we're not doing that. We're doing something else, and we don't get a really Really, we get not much of anything on the teachings of right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Because if you live in a monastery, it's sort of obvious. So I always want to speak about those three terms a little because I think they're really important. And I think the first one is really important that we underestimate the value, which is typically known as right speech, which to me just sounds like here come the rules on how to be a good Buddhist when one talks. Doesn't it sound like that? And that's certainly part of it. But it's such a small part of it. The word uh, in, in the Pali discourse is, is the word for right is sama, which doesn't really mean right. It means it's hard to describe what it means. Maybe skillful would be a better way to look at it. Also, it's vacha. Vacha doesn't really mean speech. I think it means voice, which is I think a, a more interesting term, voice. So I think a lot of the work that we're trying to do in our lives, I don't know about you, but I talk, talking right now, I mean, we talk a lot. And we, we, many of us find that we don't have a really fabulous relationship to our voice. Right? And I think part of the practice is trying to find our voice. And how do I, how do I, because the voice is the vehicle. The voice is the great vehicle. If I'm going to express to you or to anybody what's going on for me internally, the only way I can do that is through my voice and also through the language that I have. So if I have a limited vocabulary, in a limited language, I'm not going to be able to express my voice or to express my inner life in a way that is going to be conveyed in a way with this reciprocity where I actually feel like I'm being heard. And a lot of it is like we live in our lives, we don't feel like we're being heard. Or we don't feel like anybody's listening and we don't feel validated. And we, a lot of times we don't necessarily take the responsibility of like, well, am I expressing myself in an articulate way? Am I expressing myself in an honest way? Am I actually saying what I really mean? Or am I kind of using implicit language? Well, a lot of times what we do, we kind of, we throw things out there and we hope it lands and then we assess how it landed with the person that didn't land and we throw more out there. We have a hard time speaking directly to each other. You notice? And, and to the point, and I value this, I think it's important, but let's be honest, we've got to the point in our culture where we have to pay somebody 250 bucks an hour to go sit in a little room with the door shut with a little noise machine on the other side of the door to actually do that. That's a little bit sad. And I, I've been on both ends of that. I like to go into the room, little room, and express myself, right? I think there's a lot of value in that, but 
it, I think it's just kind of odd that that's what it's come down to. That we don't, we, we, we're, we have been so unable to find somebody that we can express ourselves with that we actually have to go to a paid professional. When we could be doing that for each other, probably much of the time. And some of us, many of us, probably many of us, have people we can do that with. But it's actually pretty rare. People have a hard time finding people to connect with. And so part of, part of meditation is uh, also, I think, in many ways, much of the training, a huge aspect of the training, is really trying to deal with the internal voice, the voice that you talk to yourself in your own head with. You know this voice? Called the chitta. Copy chitta, monkey mind, in Pali. That kind of, uh, you know, and there's a lot of them in there. You know what I'm saying? There's one microphone. All the voices fight for the microphone. Yeah. Every time they, they get on the microphone, my voice is the one that comes through though. There's some kind of filter in there. And so, if we, that's why I'm a huge um, advocate and really probably put it front and center for metta practice, Brahma Vihara practice. You know, do I, have I even developed an inner voice of kindness for myself? Have I developed an inner voice of care, of compassion for myself? Have I developed an inner voice of gratitude or appreciation for myself? Equanimity, understanding. Probably many of us, if we're honest, we admit that those voices are very underdeveloped. And if it's underdeveloped, if I can't even find that voice and express that voice and familiarize myself with that voice in a contemplative way, how am I going to do it with somebody else? And then I come up, then I'm unable, then I get, you know, we, we actually say this in colloquial terms, you know, like we're talking to somebody, you know, like, I, we actually say, I'm having a hard time finding the words. We say that. You know why we say that? Because we're having a hard time finding the words. I did, I'm not finding the right words. I'm, I don't feel like I'm getting, I'm wanting to express something to you, but it's, it's coming across clumsy or, or inarticulate, and, and I get kind of frustrated with myself that I can't do that. So, so, so this practice of right speech, or samavacha, finding our voice, really begins with that. And that is a tremendously huge undertaking. Years. Tremendously huge undertaking. Right? So if we, I, I think we really miss the bigger picture, and we miss out on the dynamic uh, instructions and the message of the early Buddhist thinkers of like, this is a big, big undertaking. And if we're not seeing this as part of a contemplative practice or a Dharma practice, um, of course it's kind of implied a little bit, we say these phrases, but it's never really put in a very articulate way of like, get your inner voice somewhat in a place that feels okay. And if you do, you'll just be so much happier if you do. <laughs> but it's worth it. And this is like one of eight path factors. I haven't even talked about how we speak to other people. But this is an inside out job, I think, a lot of the work that we do here. I think we really have to get that. Again, if I can't do it for myself, then I can't do it with other people so much. So again, so it's that voice in my mind, you know this. If anything, if I, if I can say anything with, with, with great degree of confidence, the inner voice in my mind that I have today compared to the one I had 30 years ago is a completely different set of characters. So different. That's, if I could point to one thing that has drastically changed as a result of meditation practice, I would definitely say that that's the one that's most obvious to me. And if that's all you get out of this, I'm totally happy for you. If you got nothing else out of this at all, except for your inner voice with more why? So what is the voice of wisdom and kindness anyway? Because that's really what thinking is, right? Isn't thinking just you talking to you in your head, basically? Mm -hmm. How well is that going? <laughs> How's that going? <laughs> My friend Vinny, Vinny Ferraro, who is a teacher of mine, fabulous teacher, when I used to see him, he would, uh, he would look at me right in the eyes and he'd put his hand on my chest and he'd go, <laughs> and I'd be like totally freaked out when he asked me that question. Like, 
כן? It's not that even cry. If he'd be like, how is it going in there? Like it's not so good in here. It's like a nightmare. <laughs> Just like bah, 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 bah. 47 people are fighting over the microphone. So again, I think, I think if we I think if we see the practice of right speech and we can kind of think of it in this way, it really, really comes to life. Really, really comes to life. And this is why Kalyana Mitas, they call it good friend, Dharma friend. People that you know, people here in the Dharma Center, you guys are so lucky you have a Dharma Center. You can, you can start to kind of explore this stuff. You know, you can kind of have coffee or talk about the teachings of the book that you read or talk to people. You know, that's so good for you to do this. It's not about agreeing. Uh, it's, about, it's about kind of finding voices that are helpful. And, that, and then so that, that's a big part of it. The, the next one that I want to speak about is typically called right action. Which is so kind of basic or benign. But I don't think that's right. Um, action, of, and, and, and this is interesting too, because this is one of the ones that should be, somebody should have obviously caught, because the term is samakamanta. Most of you know, does anybody know the word for action in Buddhism? Karma. Thank you, karma. <laughs> but it's not samakama, it's samakamanta. If the Buddha wanted to say right action, he had a perfectly good word for that. And that was a very karma, if you probably know. If anybody knows any words in the Buddhist lexicon, karma is the one they know. Of course, nobody has any idea what it means, including myself. <laughs> but it's the word we all know. Kamanta doesn't mean action. Kamanta means more like um, vocation, occupation, what, in quotes, what one does in the world, which to me sounds like an action. That sounds like right either. Right action is really more about, um, I think, about our work, not what I do for my job. See, in our culture, it's all about my work and my job, and I'm a person. You know, you go to a party, you go to a cookout, you go and you go, what's one of the first questions somebody asks you? What do you do? What do you do? That all, and, and that is such an American cultural thing, like, it's like, what do you do? And it's not that it's rude or they don't care, but it's just like, that's really what you want to talk about? And I hate this question because I'm oftentimes in rural, Colorado, I one of my friends, and I have to come, I always tell them I'm a mental health professional. I go, I work in mental health, and then they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> That's boring. And then once in a while, my wife, if the person seems like they're actually interested, she goes, he does not, he's a Buddhist teacher, he doesn't like talking about it. So I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then here I am, dealing with people's poorly, poorly informed concepts about what Buddhism is. Right. But I think when we have to, we have to separate these two. I think our work is more, and I like this word vocation because vocation actually has a religious connotation to it or a spiritual connotation to it. Also the word vocation is also related to the previous word, voice, vox. Vocation means a calling, which also has that kind of previous background. We feel called to do something. And it doesn't always have to be epic. A lot of times we think about like, we think, right, you know, we have to do some, you know, epic thing. Maybe just working on somebody's car is good enough. It doesn't always have to be so epic. Yeah. But the work, and people who are in recovery know this idea of doing our work. We try to do our 12 step but We do our work of, of recovering ourselves or healing. People in therapy know this way, you know, you do your work. You know, they, they talk, we talk about doing our work. And our work is not what you do for a job. Your work is your work. Working out your childhood, <laughs> working out the issues from your previous relationships, working out your destructive relationship to the internet or to money or to drugs or to alcohol or to consumption or whatever it is. We all have our work. And of course, we need to have some sense of what our work is or might be, or we won't do it. Might even be something like purpose, which I know sometimes again sounds like a big idea. Maybe it's not purpose singular, maybe it's purpose is. My purpose is I want to create positive change in the world. I want to make people more aware of uh, the climate situation or social issues. Or There's plenty of shit out there that needs to be worked on. You know what I mean? Like we can all do our small little part in that and feel good about that. That doesn't always have to be so epic. The Dharma work, I always use. I, I don't even think of I usually call it Dharma practice. But it's not practice. Practice would be too fun. This is Dharma work. So what is our Dharma work? That's an interesting question. I, what is it? Oh, I'm, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be kinder to myself. 
I'm trying to have better boundaries with other people. I'm trying to sit more. I'm trying to find ways to get on retreat more. I'm trying to carve out whatever it is. I'm trying to carve out time to find ways to practice or think about these things because it's interesting to me. All different kinds of ways of looking at work. Now, when you stand this up against the next one, it changes the dynamic a little bit because I don't think the next one is really sama ajiva, right? Livelihood. Ajiva means for life. What I do for life is really what I do to survive. So it's really about survival. In our culture, what I do to survive is probably correlated to what I do for money. If I was to write you a $5 million check tonight, who would actually show up for work on Monday? And we'd probably be like, I would, I'm not going into the office, right? So that survival. So again, and, and this is what's so hard because A, we're not monastics, right? Monastic, you live, in a, you live in a monastery, you're provided food, you're provided shelter, you're provided with medicine. You don't actually, the survival piece has been taken care of for you for the most part. Now, people who live in the monastery, their conditions are not always very comfy, but their basic needs are generally met. And so the thing that I find is interesting is if the Buddha only intended for this practice to be a monastic tradition, then the teaching of rent livelihood would be kind of irrelevant, wouldn't it? Because the only way to practice was to be a monk or a bhikkhuni or a bhikkhu. There'd be no reason for that path practice. So why is it there? That's always the question that I think is interesting. And why it's there, I think, is because some time ago, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, in the time of the Buddha, there were actually monks, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, and there were also lay people. I don't like this word, I just use the word non-monastics. There were people who actually considered themselves Dharma practitioners, adherent, in technical terms, adherents of Gautama, who were farmers, who were butchers, who were bakers, who were people who lived in the merchant world. They, they had jobs, they had families, they had to deal with the demands of survival. They had families they had to take care of, they had households they had to run. They were people who were of the world who were uh, and this is this is really really played out really explicitly explained in the early discourses. This was definitely a thing that was happening. Now that vanished probably at the time of the Buddha's death or very soon after. But it's interesting. I think well that right livelihood thing is still been in there. So how do we survive in a way that we feel good? Doesn't mean we all have to work for Greenpeace and like do these big epic social movements. It's like a lot of times we put the pressure on them, these right livelihood means that we have to have some helper profession of, like, of a significant stature. That, that's definitely fine and good and important, but it's not necessarily the case. And the thing that's so hard for most of us, is I hear this all the time, people talk about, you know, I can't get on retreat or I can't practice. I, I can't do my work, my inner work, call it that, because I'm trying so hard to survive. Remember 40 hours a week with a full-time job? 40 hours a week is a part-time job in America now. If you only work 40 hours a week, 40 hours, that was supposed to be like the top. There was an article I read in the middle of the pandemic called the 25th hour. And it was this whole analogy of like how corporate America is like trying to figure out how they're going to get that 25th hour out of you. Right? Which is kind of funny because I mean, we all know they're 24 hours in the day. So the, the joke is like, yeah, we were supposed to be giving them eight, and they're trying to figure out how to get 25 out of us. Right? Who checks work emails at 10 p.m. at night? I'm sure, somebody, you know, and who feels obligated or expected to check work emails at 10 o'clock at night and even respond to them? So, the thing that's so hard, and this is why I think the courage piece is so hard, and I think this is something that I've been struggling with for years, and it's kind of alive in my practice and always is that if I actually have to work and I actually have to survive, but I have to do them at the same time. I have to do that, learn how to do them simultaneously. You know, I have to get up early in the morning and I have to sit. I have to read and I have to practice. And then I have to get the kids up and I gotta drive them to school. I gotta come home and work some more. And it's like but a lot of times I feel like my survival, my job job, is is somehow getting in the way of my practice work that I want to do. And then that then then as those external demands pile up, as they tend to do, 
then I lessen and lessen my kind of inner resources or the building of my inner resources. Then I get full of doubt or I get upset, I get angry, I get frustrated. I want the world to not be like this. Why is the world like this? It shouldn't, it shouldn't be like this. You ever had that thought? We all have a very, very attractive, long, long list of things that should not be. <laughs> and they're probably all pretty accurate. So the thing about the Buddha, the reason why I think of him as a social activist, I think if you were to if you were to look at him as a historical person living in the world, living in a society, dealing with a society, dealing with culture, he would he would much more fit in social activist than he would as a religious figure. Because he wasn't actually interested in the way things are. A lot of times we think about the Buddha as interested. We talk about uh, the Buddha understood things as the, as they really are. It's just kind of part of it. But what he was really, really interested in is how things could be. How things could be. How good can human beings do? How good can we actually do? How happy can we actually be? That's a whole different thing, isn't it? And the thing that, that really kind of uh, really motivates and inspires me is actually in 2,500 years, we still have yet to even come close to even scratching the surface of his intended vision for our human beings. So they, they oftentimes say that the Eightfold Path is the path that leads to the end of suffering, which is 99% of books on Buddhism would tell you that. And in my heretical disposition, uh, it doesn't say that in early discourses. It says the Eightfold Path leads to a city. You can, you can look it up right in the Pali Canon. It's, it's, it's a sutra called the city. He said, I followed this eight paths and this eight branches, and it led me to a city. A way of life that isn't just about me flourishing, it's about human flourishing. It's not about individual flourishing. It's not about, you know what, the world is a nightmare and it's going down, and I just want to be, I just want to build an inner kingdom of serenity for myself. Which is, again, you can do worse than terrible. <laughs> But I don't think we're quite seeing the full picture of what, what's possible. So I think when we, when we think of wisdom, which is a word that sort of, I'd be hard pressed to define it. What the hell is wisdom? It's knowing something that I don't already know. Doesn't sound right. But it's really a, an understanding and an acknowledgement of my limitations and which way, how am I limited as a human being? Can I be honest and explicit and discreet about the way that I'm limited? Which is a lot. It's about limitations. Limitations of the body, limited, limitations of old age, of sickness, of death, of not getting what I want, getting what I don't want. Limited, very limited. But also to not just be aware of the limitations, but also to be aware and to be optimistic about the possibilities. What's possible? What can I do with this mind? What can I do with this voice? What can I do with this life? What can I do with these actions? What, what can I contribute in a way that actually might help? And so that, that to me, it, it would be summed up in this phrase called the whole life path, which is, I think, not everybody wants that, right? That's okay. I'm certainly not for everybody, and I'm certainly not for most, hmm. right? And I'm, I'm okay with being in that position. But, but some people really uh, want out of this practice, a, a, a path that includes your whole life, your whole life. There's actually a, a book, I'll give him credit for it because he coined the term, Gregory Kramer, the Dharma teacher in the Pacific Northwest, he wrote a book many years ago called Insight Dialogue. He's like one of these brilliant, brilliant teachers that not that many people are aware of. I highly recommend checking him out. He had a book he wrote maybe around the beginning of the pandemic, it came out, it's called A Whole Life Path. And it's a, it's a, it's a very big book, 350 pages or so. It's all on the Eightfold Path from, a, from an early discourse, from a Theravada perspective. But it's also very, very present day. A lot of these ideas that I'm, that I'm discussing this evening come out of that book. I was like, really like, okay, like, where, is, where, where could this be going? Like, you guys, this is great. You guys have this beautiful Dharma Center, all these people. You, know? you probably know this, but Bozeman is not exactly known as the Mecca of Western Dharma. <laughs> right? So maybe maybe I'm wrong about that. You know, so it's like this this possibility that emerges where we can um, 
practice with ourselves, practice with each other, and dare I say, get a little bit excited about this. Right? I mean, Buddhism can be so boring, I mean, such a downer. So I'm bringing dukkha all the time. <laughs> no, 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 that's like the beginning of it. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I'll say a few words about tomorrow because you probably have some things to add. Uh, for those of you who have never done a day on